Hey. <laughs> no crazy transition this time. Yeah. Hey guys. And all our stuff. I know. This is a little personal now. Now we've gotten sort of together on the couch. Uh, less boxish. That's why I said I'm used to being over there. A little Hi, bit Theo. of a fireplace in the background. What's going on, Theo? Welcome to Books and Brew. Oh, yeah, my I, I am losing where the camera is because it's not normally in my same spot. It's over there it's now. It's over there. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to drink some kombucha, but we didn't have any. That was my mistake. I overestimated how much we had. So, yes, Books and Brew. Um, the whole point of this series is that we're going to be going over uh, some certain D&D books. Uh, as well as the content that's in them, especially subclasses, feats, uh, new spells, new magic items, um, new rules. New, yeah, and we're not going <laughs> to cover everything today, obviously. Again, I'm, I'm focusing on the wrong spot. <laughs> we're obviously not gonna... it, it looks like... Oh, no, no, okay. No. <laughs> we're, we're... I was like, it looks like we're talking to the camera there, but my eyes are... We actually have two books today. Um, oh, I thought you were going to show them the jacked up one from Target. Oh. Not to put Target on no, blast, but I don't, damn. <laughs> yeah. We have we have a secondary, another one of these, uh, the Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Uh, unfortunately, Target decided that uh, they wanted to do Malcolm X on it. Yeah, it looks like a snowplow. American ran, History X, that's it. Ran over it a couple times. And then uh, Amber got me a Hero's Feast uh, for Christmas, which is a giant D&D cookbook. And they I have. I got you Tasha's for Christmas too. It's just you, you did. preemptively opened it. <laughs> I mean, look at that. Come on. That is so cool. And they actually show you how to make elixirs. I'm going to put those in quotes because obviously it's just drinks. Come here, bud. Um, he figured out we're streaming. Yeah, I'll put that right there. But uh, I wanted to go a few over a few of the uh, subclasses here that come in Tasha's. Um, the best, the, I think the biggest thing that came out of Tasha's, or the bulk. I feel like a lot of shit in there is broken, to be honest with you. Like, what? Well, no, I mean, like, a lot of it's OP. Like, I didn't even read through all of it, but I, like, the part I skimmed through, I'm just like, I feel like it gave a lot of classes, like, major buffs. Well, yeah, so the, uh, the biggest thing that they introduced into Tasha's is the optional class features. And this happens for every single class. Regardless of what you chose, you can get additional feats um, that were not available to you. <laughs> He's trying to get so, Mike's cup. Like, uh, I think the, the quickest thing that comes to mind is uh, a rogue. You can now use your bonus action to get uh, advantage on your next... Uh, it's called aim, steady aim. You can now get an advantage on your next range attack. It's kind of like Hunter's Mark. Kind, well, kind of, yeah. Except the biggest thing about rogues is that once you have once you have advantage, and you land your attack, you get your sneak attack. So essentially, it's saying you can spend your bonus action and get your sneak attack if you land. Which is I feel uh, like rogues were already broken at certain levels. It's pretty. It, it <laughs> felt pretty broken right away, but uh, it's fairly interesting. The biggest thing that actually came out of Tasha's is that they introduced or not introduced, they included the artificer. Um, and every single subclass underneath the Artificer. So essentially, Artificer was only available in, in Eberron, right. which is another book. And now they are like, well, let's put it on a mainstream one. So every single Artificer is in this book. Yeah, because I know you told me it wasn't in 5e, but like a lot of people played it. Yeah. Well, it was in Eberron, which made it official. Uh, but they decided to reprint it into here. <laughs> and they included the Armor subclass. Don't mind this this attention horror. He like loves when we're on stream. <laughs> well, let's let's start off with our breakdown with a random class that we've actually made a character for. So, do you want me to go first? Or do you want to go first? You go first. Okay. <laughs> so let me flip through. I'm gonna try to find. I only made one to Mike's three, but Mike is also a. D I made four. DM, so you know. Yeah, I have a problem. I have no problem, like, concept-wise. It's just stat-wise. It kind of throws me because it's a lot to look at, so... I need help sometimes. <laughs> yes, Thea, I see all your cats. There's only one cat on camera today. Though. Oh, you know what? Let's start with one of what has become one of my favorite subclasses. What? Um, the, uh, the Druid oh, the fire Circle storm. of the Wildfire. This has become my favorite subclass. 
now. Um, or at least one of them, like at least <laughs> in the top five. So let me show uh, you guys a a little sh uh, a little sneak peek. I just realized something that our chat is not showing. Really weird. I'm sorry about this, guys. So the cat was yelling at us. There you are. There you guys are. <laughs> Man. <laughs> There you guys are. I'm sorry about that. He said hello. <laughs> Literally at the camera, you're doing a better job than mom and dad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, uh, the wildfire, uh, circle wildfire. Druids with the circle wildfire understand that destruction is sometimes the uh, precursor to creation. Such as a forest fire promotes larger growth, these druids <laughs> bond with a primor primal spirit that harbors both destruction and creative powers. I want to say your username is Allow Drock. Thank you. I went if I butcher that, I'm sorry. <laughs> What's going on, Drock? Oh, it's Drock. <laughs> this is this is a uh, Banks. Drock is uh, I know Drock. Absolutely. This is one of our little screwballs that comes out in our group sessions that we normally do that sometimes balances on that side of the room. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me. What's up, Tommy? Hi, Tommy. All right, let me continue. Uh, so these druids bond with a primordial spirit that harbors both destructive and creative powers, allowing the druids to create uh, create controlled flames <laughs> <I feel. laughs> that burn away one thing but giving life to another. Buddy, I'm reading here. I'm reading here. He doesn't care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what so, does that cat care about anything you do? <laughs> so a little a little breakdown to what a druid is. A druid is an individual who is connected with nature. Um, they don't actually have to be connected to a nature goddess or a god, just as long as they have some some strong connection with uh, you know the sea, the mountains, the the An deserts. aspect of nature, yeah. pretty much. A, a druid is a hippie, kinda. It, there's, it's not. They're far like off. OP as fuck though. I play a druid. Druids are really OP. Like at certain levels, you're just an elemental, or you can shapeshift no matter how many times. You, it doesn't matter. So one thing that. Uh, that a druid is very well known for, especially when it comes to classes and their abilities, is a thing called Wild Shape. Wild Shape, depending on what subclass you get, because a moon druid can turn into bigger bigger beasts uh, as they start to level up. Uh, if you pick any other druid, they're kind of stuck. They get, a, they get a barrier and they, they can only turn into certain creatures, but they could still turn into creatures, which is the whole point of a druid, is that you can turn into a bear and you can fuck shit up that way, and you'd have the hit points of a bear, and then once you get knocked out, you're back to normal. So you basically have some armor as a beast, which is really fun. <laughs> the best thing about a, a wildfire druid is you can spend uh, your, your wild shape abilities, because you only get a certain amount, uh, and you can conjure up a little small uh, fire spirit. You can always flavor it. Maybe you have a little wild spirit uh, otter, or a cat. <laughs> or a fire spirit cat. So basically, a, a creature that is made of fire that looks like an animal. You know, maybe you put like a little raccoon or something. It's really, really cute. Um, kind of reminds me of, I mean, just because we just watched it, the Patronus Charm and Harry Potter. Exactly. Exactly. A hundred percent. Now, not all druids get subclass spells, meaning that they can learn these spells naturally. Uh, they don't actually have to pick them through a list. They just get them regardless. Uh, wildfire spirits, uh, wildfire druids learn a lot of fire type spells. Burning hands, they actually get cure wounds. So a little bit like their flame is starting to heal. You know, it's creative. Yeah. It's not all destructive. You can do plant growth. If you wanted to burn a cinder and then have the remains grow, you can do that. I feel like, and this goes for my character that I'll eventually get to, but I feel like fire is very much looked at as more destructive mm -hmm. than anything like good. Like you just think of shit on fire. <laughs> you don't think like, oh, you know, it, it has warmth or it has yeah. healing properties. It's or, all but, about energy, shared yeah. energy. Um, so I, your wild spirit you can use, you can summon as a wild uh, wildfire druid, uh, starts to level up as you level up. So it it is very, useful because the stronger you get the stronger it gets uh at sixth level you get to learn a thing called enhanced bond meaning that when you summon your fire spirit uh your let's see here is this like the familiar thing kind of kind of except you can't unfortunately see through the fire spirit 
It's its own entity. But it does damage for you, right? It, you can command it to do damage. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it says here, whenever you cast a spell that does fire damage or restores hit points, while your wild spirit is summoned, you can roll a d8 and you can add that to either the damage or the healing. Hmm. So if you were to heal someone while your fire spirit was out, it would add to it. You get a boost. You get a little boost, which is nice. Uh, you can give, uh, at 10th level, you get a thing called uh, Carterizing Flames. Uh, let's see here. When, da, 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 when a small creature dies within six, uh, 30 feet of you or your wild spirit, um, a harmless spectral flame springs forth from the dead creature's space, flickers there for a minute. When a creature you see enters that space, you can use your reaction to extinguish the flame there and heal the creature. So essentially what you do is that if someone dies, you can uh, you can see it and react, putting up a bit of a fire, spiritual fire, and on the end of their turn you can go and heal. <laughs> and it only happens when a creature is out. Is out. Uh, you can only use this a uh, number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. So obviously the higher you get in level, the more times you can use it. And of course uh, the the healing or damage that you can do, because you can also switch to damaging, is 2d10 plus your wisdom modifier. So the biggest thing you want to do as a wildfire druid is up that wisdom. Yeah, because it's better. Do they like a dump stat or a very good stat? Yeah, you want to you up it. <laughs> Depending on what you are. Uh, the last thing you get as a wildfire druid is blazing revival. Uh, the bond with you and your wild, uh, wildfire spirits can save you from death. If the spirit was within 120 feet of you and you're reduced to zero hit points and there, thereby fall unconscious, you can cause the spirit to drop to zero hit points and then you regain the hit points uh, that, that the spirit has lost. Hmm. So you basically <laughs> trade your, your how HP. How long is it out for though? Uh, your wild, oh, your, how long your wild spirit could be out? Uh, it doesn't give you a, a time? Time frame. Well, so, well, I know, but like I'm just saying, like an effect, like some things are only open, not open, out for like an hour. Like Vera's thing is like only like an hour. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at it here. Summon Wild Spirit, which is a second level ability. Um, you can Still summon it. Oh, it manifests for an hour. Mm -hmm. So I did make a character <laughs> using this because this is obviously my favorite now. Cat's laying on all the charm. <laughs> so uh, let me introduce you guys to a little character that I made. I have the backstory here. Mike wrote his down. I'm just going to tell you mine because mine's in my head. Yeah, I wrote everything down. Here it goes. So let me introduce you to Igdal Forgeheart. Uh, Igdal Forgeheart is a dwarf, mountain dwarf. So lives up uh, high up in the mountains uh, and a druid of the wildfire. So here's a little bit of a backstory and something that maybe you want to implement in your characters. Uh, Igdal Forgeheart, also known as Iggy, lived with their father up in the mountains far from a neighboring village. As a child, their father taught them how to hunt, how to survive in the cold wilderness of a high mountaintop living, and most importantly, at least to Iggy, the art of carpentry. Uh, Iggy loved crafting and would spend most of their time, uh, most of their free time, building small little wooden animals and trees. One night, a strange storm overtook the mountaintop as well as the town below, covering the entire land in a thick blanket of snow, trapping Iggy and their father in their home. As the temperature dropped, Iggy's father developed a fever and was bedridden, and the situation was looking dire as the Dwarven family was running out of firewood to keep the fire going. And you didn't own much, neither did their father. But, and he took a breath, shed a tear, and used their collection of wooden statues as kindling. That night, regardless of their effort, Iggy's father passed away. Iggy cried that night as the last of his statues were used up uh, and the cabin started to freeze. A spirit of the woods took pity on Iggy, watching the sacrifice. And within the dead ashes in the fireplace, now stood a fire spirit in the form of a fox. 
It promised that it would never be uh, that he would that they would never be alone, and they would always carry the uh, their father's warmth. Igdal Forge Heart, with the aid of their fire spirit friend, was able to leave the cabin. And they now travel the lands, finding out the cause of the terrible and strange winter. See, I didn't write all that. <laughs> so, I love the idea that. Yes, fire can be destructive, but this was a case where it was needed, and yeah, I know. I, I honestly like <laughs> the cat didn't like the sad ending. <laughs> I like creating characters that have a, a they're a bit damaged. All I want to say is it's very easy to make damaged or tragic or sad characters that I guess progress through D and D because you got to have like a reason, and then like the reasons are always like. <laughs> <laughs> a good example I like to say is no happy person wants to go fight a dragon. If you are happy Unless in your town, you're just like that gung-ho. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> or if, nuts. If you are a normal person wouldn't leave their town and village to go fight a Balrog. No one is gonna do that. You know, so obviously you have to have a little bit of damage, you have to have a little bit of drama uh, for your character to go out. So I figured there's a strange winter happening. Uh, Iggy lost their father and I really like the way I created this character because I've been saying them they and their mm -hmm. um, when I created Iggy what I had in mind was this person was gender neutral you like hip with the times <laughs> I, I liked it because I was like the way I, I had it was fire is neither feminine nor masculine and I always thought when Iggy was a child that they probably felt that way and it didn't matter to the father. The father, what they would say is, you know, you're a piece of work, you're a piece of art, and however you feel is fine with me. Yeah. And so they were they were content. But sometimes you gotta break someone <laughs> to have them go travel. They were nice and happy and then, you know, <laughs> yeah. good old DM. <laughs> That's what I do, man. <laughs> But I liked it. I, I like Iggy, and it, it honestly, it, it, the character in the in the subclass has become my temple, <laughs> my favorite. Ah, oh, hey temple! I love that. Yeah, I love I love Iggy. She, uh, they they've become my my favorite. Uh, so let's jump to another subclass. Do you want to do yours? You want to? We can take it. <laughs> Mine's not gonna be as good as Mike's. That's I mean, fine. That's fine. I mean, I gave her more of a backstory in my head this morning. I did not write a whole thing like Mike did, but Do I. Do you can... want to show it off? No, I go last. Okay, I'll go last. <laughs> uh, another character that I created using one of the subclasses uh, here in Tasha's is a way of the astral self monk. So let me go and read out what they can do, and what their abilities are. A monk who follows the way of the astral self. Uh, believes that their body is an illusion. Uh, they see their key as a rep representation of their truth self, their astral self. Uh, this astral self has capabilities, has the capability of being a force of order and disorder. So you can play it either way you wish. Uh, and so basically, to summarize, the astral self monk can summon a like a spectral arm or a spectral face or body as they start to I don't know if up. you can show that picture. That's like a good representation. Yeah. A little bit. You can see a lizard folk monk with what looks like to be like spectral arms uh, surrounding it, which is really cool. So at third level, what you get is arms of the astral self. Uh, you can spend one key point because as a monk, you get a certain number amount of key points. As you start to level up, you get more. Uh, and you can summon your astral arms that can deal uh, force damage, they're magical, and they have an extra five feet of reach. So instead of hitting with five feet, you can hit 10 feet, which is pretty big. Uh, in addition, when, when it comes to melee fighting, you generally use your strength or your dexterity score because that sort of determines how well you can punch or how quickly you can do so and do damage. This focuses when you bring up astral arms they use your your wisdom score so the more wise you are the stronger your astral fists do how well they can punch so when you're creating this monk i would say focus on wisdom <laughs> 
Wisdom and wisdom and dex. Because when you don't when you run out of key points, you still need to do some damage. Yeah, because I haven't seen too many monks that are like strength based. It's always generally like dex. I mean that's different, but I mean like a traditional monk, it's basically like dexterity. Yeah. Uh, so that's what happens when you summon your astral arms. Uh, you also at sixth level get a thing called the Vistage of the Astral Self. Essentially what you do is you spend a key point and you can bring out your astral arms and a helmet or a visor or goggles or whatever you want to flavor that uh, your astral mask looks like. I've seen some art of like astral monks where their astral self is like a beetle. So their arms are like these beetle arms. And when it comes to their mask, you see uh, a horn of a beetle. That's so cool. Vistage, which is really, yeah, it's really cool. Um, essentially, when you summon your, your vestige, your, your mask, you can see in both dark, uh, in darkness, both magical and non-magical, up to 120 feet. So basically, you can see everything. Uh, you have advantage on wisdom checks, uh, insight, and intimidation. So you can basically, oh, you want me to piss you or you want me to you know intimidate you you can put it on and you can have words of the spirit meaning that you can look at a creature within 60 feet and speak telepathically essentially you have a comms which is really <laughs> cool um at 11th level you have body of the astral self so so far you've had the arms now you have the mask or the face now you have the body uh and what happens here is that you can now do deflect energy when you take acid, cold, fire, and lightning damage. So basically any spells, you can reduce that amount by like, I think 1d10 plus your wisdom modifier. You can do this in a certain number of times. Not just based off of your form though? You can or choose. Or the, the vestige you choose? Yeah, you can choose. So if someone hits you with a fireball, you're gonna get hit, you're gonna get some damage, but you can use a reaction and take away a little bit of those flames, which is really cool. Uh, and then you get empowering arms. Uh, essentially, one thing that a monk has is called the Flurry of Blows. And you can use your bonus action to hit twice. So monks, what they usually do is they walk up to someone, they hit twice, and then they use a key point and they hit another two times. Which is, it's that's four attacks in one round. That's a lot. That's what they're known for. They're known to, to be skirmishers. They hit you quick hit you hard, and then back up. Or stun your ass. Or stun your, yeah, stun your <laughs> ass. Uh, with so this, they don't have to deal with you for a run. What this does is that not only can you hit quick, your empowered arms do more damage. So you're, you're hitting hard, and now you're hitting even harder, which is really cool. And the last thing you get is the Awakened Astral Self at level 17. There's only 20 levels for anyone who's curious. Uh, you have to spend five key points to do this. Yeah, right? Well, don't you get more as you level up, right? At level 17, you'll have 17 key, key points. Mm -hmm. So that's still good. That's a chunk of it. Uh, essentially, you're basically, instead of your arms, your face, and your body, you're summoning everything. You are now an astral being. Uh, you get a few abilities. One, you have the armor of spirit. Your AC is up by two, so you're harder to hit. You have astral barrage. Uh, whenever you use the extra attack feature, you can attack twice for free. So no more spending key points to do flurry of blows. You get four out the gate. No more having to spend it. Uh, and I think that's it. That's still pretty big. And I think it lasts for a while. It lasts for 10 minutes. In combat terms, that's a lot. Yeah, I was like, because isn't it like one round? Six seconds. Yeah. One round in combat is six seconds. Yeah. So I did make an Astro Monk for you guys. Uh, I'm currently playing as him in our Sunday game. I, I like this guy too. Uh, this is Bolide. This is Bolide, and for those who don't know, Bolide is a terminology given to, I think, it's Falling comets? Star or something. Yeah, something like it that. It is the light from a comet, the trail behind. So it's not actually the comet, it's the light that follows. Kind of fits the Astromo uh, thing. Um, he's a water genasi. So, I like how we went opposites. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah. Uh, so, I the way I made it, I don't actually have a, a story written out for, for Bolide because I've been playing him and I kind of have his story already in, uh, memorized. Is Bolide as a child uh, was born to two human parents. When it comes to Genasis, you don't have to be born from Genasi. 
as long as there's some sort of elemental storm or event or occurrence that's happening during your birth, you could be born as a Genasi. Uh, D and D is weird. <laughs> uh, you can sneeze and you can turn into something different. It's a weird thing. But essentially, uh, Bolide was born from two human parents who thought of him as a freak because in their world, they were like, "Well, you're not our child. You're not, you know, skin colored. You're blue," which kind of freaked them out. Uh, they lived at a dock uh, in a in a small dock town, and they basically mistreated Bolide his entire life. Uh, his mother would call him a freak and say that uh, his her real baby is out in the sea somewhere, and they left they dumped this creepy fish creature in place. Uh, his father used him more for labor, so he was taught in the ways of fishing and in the ways of sailing, but as a means of free labor. So he did take some skills, which is nice, but. It's kind of hard to be motivated when your parents are kind of... Not... Assholes. <laughs> uh, Bolide, one day, I think, I think I made it that he was 16 years old, a bunch of the local teens started to basically beat up on him, uh, kicking, punching, drawing blood, uh, and he was laying out on the docks, uh, just bloodied and battered. His parents, and he saw, his parents were watching. And instead of intervening and stopping, they just sort of stopped, watch, and didn't act. Bolide had enough, ran away, and went to a nearby beach where he actually became a beach bum. You know, he was poor. He, he begged for food. He tried to fish. Um, though he owned no fishing rods, he did whatever he could. He doesn't. He doesn't fight back. When he, I, the way I made it was that. He was very sheltered because his parents didn't want to have him outdoors. So he was very like, nice. don't look at this, basically. Yeah. He worked on the docks. He knew how to do that. Other than that, he never went into town. That was the point. Uh, so he was very nubile. Uh, Bolide one night uh, out in the beach, looked up into the stars and wanted to. And I kind of go dark in here. He tried to kill himself. Uh, by drowning, but obviously he didn't know about his phys physiology as a genasi and genasi's water genasi's can't drown They, they can breathe water um, He then started to hear a woman's voice and there is a deity called uh, Sahalin Moonbo, which is a, the goddess of the moon and the stars uh, Her other title is called the daughter of the night sky uh, He essentially heard her voice and followed her, went to a monastery, learned how to fight, how to protect himself, how to spread the word of the daughter, the daughter of the night sky. So the way I made it, like the picture, whenever he summons his astral arms, they are a silhouette of a hand, feminine, and they have little bits of stars and space, you know, the space dust and gas that are bright, you know, blues and purples and pinks and greens, just a beautiful sight. And uh, that's essentially Bolide, is uh, someone with a horrible past but decided to join something, had a calling, and he's now adventuring to do better. He had a come up, he married a princess. <laughs> In our story, he married a princess, which is pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Do you like that ending? <laughs> yeah. So Bolite is a... Is a... <laughs> yeah, we made some tragic characters, man. I guess I can go next, because like, okay. I picked a monk too. Bolite is a really fun character, mainly because uh, everything he does has to deal with the stars. You know, he's a navigator, so he knows, because he's a sailor, he knows how to look at the stars and navigate on the sea. Um, his entire motif is stars and the space, which is a really cool, fun idea. Mike's gonna read the way of the mercy part for me, though. Sure. <laughs> so another sub uh, subclass for the monk that came out in Tasha's was the way of the mercy monk. So this is what they do. Um, see, way of the mercy. 
They learn to manipulate the life force within others, as well as themselves, uh, to help those and aid those in need. Uh, they are basically wandering physicians uh, that can bring aid to those in need of mercy. He can see the future. So the funny thing about that, uh, Tomi, is the Unearth Arcana, meaning the uh, unofficial version of the Astral Self Monk, they gave him the option to have uh, Augury, which is sort of a, uh, a future telling spell, but they got rid of it. So unfortunately, you can't tell the future anymore. <laughs> Well, that, that's I thought you ask your god, and then they give you like a yes, no, or maybe. Essentially, you go, if I go into this cave, will it be hard, you know, like, will it be harmful to me? And the god will say yes, no, or I don't know. Or yes and no. Yeah, which is, you know, oh, so helpful. Yeah. So, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> maybe. So it's really fun. So he had the ability to tell the future, but not anymore. Which is fine. I'm totally okay with that. So... Uh, mercy monks essentially can heal. They're a bit of a healer. Uh, they have the third level ability called Implementations of Mercy. Uh, you gain the proficiency with insight and medicine checks. So you can tell when someone's maybe sick, if they're coughing, you can use an insight. You can get a little more uh, idea of what they're going through. You can also be better at medicines. Yeah, medicine checks, which is great. Medicines. Medicines. You also gain a special <laughs> mask, which you often wear when using this feature of the subclass. Uh, you don't actually have to wear, wear a mask at all. It's just giving you that option. Essentially, they're trying to make you look like a um, a plague doctor. Yeah, well, you can show the picture. Yeah, they kind of have a, a plague doctor mask character here. Mine's not going to have a mask. At least I didn't plan one for her. You can always go against the grain, which is fine. <laughs> Another uh, third level ability that you get is called Hands of Healing. You can spend a key point and you can touch a creature and restore a number of hit points uh, equal to your martial art die and your wisdom modifier. So your martial art die get, gets higher as you start to level up and of course this is another subclass of monk that you want to invest wisdom, wisdom. in. Yeah. yeah. The better your wisdom the more you're healing. So essentially you're doing that thing you're, you're uh, you're kind of almost like water bending a little bit where you're kind of like moving this ability around and imbuing into someone and uh, healing them, which is a bit of an opposite of which character is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another third uh, level ability. So once you hit third level with Mercy Monks, they get bonuses after bonuses. Then we have fun. <laughs> uh, you get Hand of Harm. So you have a Hand of Mercy and a Hand of Harm, Hand of Healing. Uh, you can use your key point to inflict wounds. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike, which is often what you're doing as a monk, you can spend one key point to deal extra necrotic damage, uh, which is your martial art die plus your wisdom modifier. So basically you can hurt and heal. It's your whole point. Uh, at sixth level, you get Physician's Touch. When you administer, uh, you can administer even greater curses uh, with a touch. And if you feel it's necessary, you can use your knowledge to cause harm. When you use your heal hand of healing on a creature, you can also end one disease. So that's pretty good. And then when you use your hand of harm, <laughs> you can subject the creature to the poison effect. He's like chubby cat breathing, sorry. No, he is. <laughs> so the whole point of the Mercy Monk is a little bit of a duality. You can hurt and you can harm. Or you can, you can heal and you can harm, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, Theo. <laughs> Uh, next, at 11th level, you get a Flurry of Healing and Harm. Uh, when you start to use your Flurry of Blows, you can now replace each unarmed strike that you use with either a Hand of Healing <laughs> without spending the key point, or you can use Hand of Harm. So essentially, you can go Heal, Heal, Harm, Harm. And you can do Poison, Poison, or Necrotic, Necrotic, or Healing, Healing, which is basically you get double. <laughs> he tried to whack you. You went like this, and he went... <laughs> Come on. Uh, at 17th level, which is the highest ability that you get as a monk, you get hand, uh, hand of Ultimate Mercy. You master life energy. energy uh, your mastery of life energy opens the door to Ultimate Mercy. As an action, you can touch a corpse of a creature that has died within the last 24 hours. <laughs> That's a hard hero to play. Extend I always like complicated Tomi. <laughs> to monks can be complicated. They have to balance a lot of things. You can spend five key points and you can basically bring this creature back to life. And you can spend some, some die and you can heal it for that amount. Uh, and then you also remove 
that amount, uh, like a, like a disease if they yeah. had it. Uh, so uh, just by by touching them. Yeah. So mercy monks are <laughs> very much the healer herders of the group, and you have your character. I feel like all my characters are complicated. I think the least complicated was Iris. Meet Phoenix. <laughs> So you need points to increase healing points and damage. Exactly. Effect. So yeah. the amount of points you have as a monk equal your total monk level. So if you're a level five monk, you have five key points and you can spend those as you start to play. You get them back after you take a rest. So after you sit back, rest, meditate, you get them back. I really like her though. Like, I mean, obviously don't kill me in this campaign, but, <laughs> but I, would, I would like to play her at some point in time. But this is Phoenix Hartford. I have a little bit of the opposite story of Bolide. I was gonna say that how she came to be, that her family lived on an island. Um, there was a volcano on that island that seemed to be dormant or inactive, but it wasn't apparently at a point in time. And that was the day that Phoenix was born. She was born to two human parents, like Bolide, we said the opposite. They were very glad to see her, even though she doesn't look like how they, they look, obviously. She has gray ash skin and bright, you know, basically flaming hair. And then she's got a little bit of, it's hard to see from here, but like a little bit of a scar mark on her face underneath her eye. Um, I don't have a story for the car. <laughs> well, the funny thing is we, we made um, our characters different levels. Yeah, we made her different. I think she's level six. Yeah, so we, we've, we, like, a, like Iggy is like a level four druid. Um, Bolide's a level 11 uh, monk at this point because I've been playing him for a while. Um, but she doesn't go by Phoenix. She goes by Finn because she, does, she doesn't like her full name. <laughs> she, she has a, uh, I guess she appreciates it because of what her mother gave it to her for. But essentially, since, you know, Phoenix rise from the ashes, that's why her mom gave her that name. And she kind of has a lot like ashy gray skin too. Mm -hmm. But like Bolide, she was very much made fun of. Um, the island she comes from, there's not like, I guess, diversity as much as other, you know, continents or other islands. It's mainly humans. It's very small. They've never seen a Genasi before, let alone whatever she is. But, um, to prove the stigma wrong because in a sense she doesn't look I guess you could say I told Mike I didn't have another word for it like good like she doesn't look like she she's like, approachable yeah she looks like <laughs> a standard 80s villain you know so I wanted her to be the opposite so in a sense of of not being angry all the time and not being upset because everybody looks at her that way she wanted to join a monastery to channel that energy into something good so she's basically trying to prove people wrong that she uses her energy or that flame for healing instead of just damage all the time. I mean, don't get me wrong, she'll still kick your ass if she needs to. <laughs> but her, her whole goal is to make the world better and to prove her image wrong, even though that's how they see her where she's from. I, since I now understand the way of the Mercy Monk a little better, that they can cause necrotic damage, uh, do you feel like when she does that, it's more like a like black flame that comes out, or maybe a different color? There's blue flame, which is more powerful, but I kind of wanted that more for her healing. But I'm I'm toying with that idea. So yeah, we'll see. Maybe like a purple. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I like fire genasis. I think they're really fun. I really wanted to make one, so that's I was just like, well, they kind of don't look. Like, like, you know, they're the person you want to go up to and be like, hey, let's be friends. <laughs> the, the Finn sounds similar to Star Wars Finn. I A guess. Little bit. I guess so. Uh, she can also heal. Also, she can heal also. Cool. Yeah. Um, I, I was reading it, Mike. I didn't have the book in front of me. I was reading it online. We have two of these copies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, like, he was like, how'd you learn? And I was like, I was reading what like type of monk I could make her into because it made sense for me to I like I don't want to make her angry but I assume that she has a lot of like maybe a fiery temper no like I guess emotions tied to how people see her so rather than being you know the opposite of Vera in that yeah. <laughs> rather than like continuously showing them like for people to essentially gain that power over her like you know you poke and you're gonna have a reaction all the time she centers that 
and that's why she's a monk. Yeah. No, yeah, that's that's essentially just sort of calming the emotion and energy within you. Uh, the way I thought of it was, uh, I think, I, I wanted to say it was the remake Karate Kid, <laughs> or was it the original, and I keep forgetting. I kind of saw, well, we kind of want to say it's the remake, where Jackie Chan takes these glass cups, lights a flame in it, and puts it onto Jaden Smith's character's body. Jaden? Okay. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> supposedly that's supposed to heal him. Like he like, does this like cupping technique. Um, Take and I was like, that's it. it's a little like that, like where you're almost using this fire to bring out or like send in the energy a little bit. Which I really like, cool. I really like her art too. I'm attached to that one and I haven't even played her. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm always, I'm always thinking of one shots. So it's not like you're not going to have an opportunity. I have so many though now. <laughs> I really liked um, Lilith. She was fun to play as, cause she was the opposite. She was very much. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it's just like fire eating the air a little bit. So you're kind of inhaling the uh, the energy. Yeah. yeah, that is that is yeah. When he fixes the leg, that's that's exactly what I was thinking of. Is the this fiery energy, um, not hot, but definitely full of key and life and spirit. Uh, can flow into a creature. I think monk's definitely an interesting class, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Because it's like you can have magic tied to it, or in a sense, like magical essence tied to it, but it's not the same as casting a spell. No, but as a fire genasi, naturally, you can do a, a cantrip called produce flame. So basically you can yeah. snap your fingers and a little bit of torch comes out of your finger and you can hurl it at someone. Uh, or you can do burning hands, which essentially you hold out your hands and a cone doing, of okay. fire is released, uh, causing just an area effect damage. So your fire genasi can heal, can do necrotic damage, can punch, can spend key, but naturally they can also just create a fire. Yeah, she can set shit on fire if she wants, but like I said, I didn't make her that way. I made her centered enough and disciplined enough to control it. There's a really fun thing here that uh, I was looking up and I'm gonna see if I can find it. Um, this, the Tasha's doesn't have anything on blood hunters, huh? No, that's still considered unearth arcana. Hmm. Yeah. I'm like curious, cause I like, I feel like not to knock Taliesin on critical role. Well, it was Taliesin and Matt Mercer that made the blood hunters. Yeah, but I felt like it was kind of meh until you got to like a higher level and I was like, that'd be interesting if they put it in Tasha's. How can she sleep with a hair of uh, that's on fire? <laughs> Or is it only glow? You can technically say she meditates. <laughs> so she oh. doesn't touch anything. <laughs> I, I, I've I made fire genasi characters uh, with not fire red hair, but actual fire hair. Yeah. Uh, the way I shape it is that the fire itself is spectral. So it wafts and lives like an actual flame. But when you touch it, touch it, it doesn't feel like anything. It almost feels like it. Essentially, the character would be bald but the flames is what, you know, is sitting on top. So that's how I play it. You can play your fire do not see it anyway. You can say that a little bit of it catches fire or maybe it's not hot enough yeah. or not powerful enough to catch something on fire. But let's say you wake up and there's a little bit of ash. Where you see <laughs> it. And it's always happening. There's a really fun thing that uh, rangers get. And unfortunately I don't have a photo because I couldn't find anything. And I don't have a full character, but I'm working on it. Yeah. Give him an hour. Give me, me an hour. it takes me a couple hours. Him, it takes him a couple See. minutes. So there is a ranger subclass called the Swarm Keeper, which I thought was really, really cool. Uh, essentially, you get to keep a like little tiny spectral spirit bugs, animals, what bugs. have you. Bugs. <laughs> and you say it like they're that? like a swarm of creatures that you can control. Well, that's like for... Um... I think you're thinking the Caduceus claim is in his beetles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But isn't that a spell? Yes, except this is different. Mm. So what you get, uh, here I'll read the, the beginning. <laughs> Tell me you got it to bugs. <laughs> uh, feeling a deep connection in the environment around them, some rangers reach out with their magical connection to the world and bond with a swarm of natural spirits. The swarm can be uh, potent, uh, a potent force in battle as well as be help as well as helpful company for the ranger. So uh, they can essentially have these little spirit bugs or creatures around you. 
Uh, at third level, you get a thing called Gathered Swarm. A swarm of creatures, they're un intangible, so they can't be touched. They're basically spirits. Have bonded uh, to you and can assist you in battle. Until you die, the swarm remains in your space, crawling on you or flying or skittering around around you. Uh, you can deter determine the appearance of it, so you can, you can flavor it in any way you wish. On each of your turns, you can cause the swarm to assist you in the following ways. When you hit a creature, the creature takes an additional 1d6 piercing damage. They can do a strength score, like a save, and if they fail it, the swarm pushes them or leads them uh, 15 feet in any direction that you can choose, or the swarm can help you and push you up five extra feet. Hmm. So if you need, need that extra space, that extra <laughs> little square of movement, you can tell your swarm to bring you along. I need a boost. <laughs> uh, at third level, you also get a thing yes. called Swarm Keeper. Uh, you get some special spells as a, as a ranger. You can get Fairy Fire, Magic Hand, Web, Gaseous Form, Arcane Eye, and Insect Plague, which is really fun. I've never gotten a chance to use Insect Plague, I don't think. Uh, at level seven, you get a thing called uh, Writhing Tide. Uh, you can condense a part of your swarm into a forced mass that lifts you up. Uh, as a bonus action, you can gain a flying speed of 10 feet and hover. Tell me, says any bugs? Any bugs? No, like any bugs, like any kind. You can, yeah, you can flavor it to <laughs> any bugs you wish. I actually have an idea for this subclass that has nothing to do with bugs. Uh, so that, that's how... I was going to say you could pull a mummy. Oh, like a bunch of scarabs? <laughs> yeah. That'd be really cool. It'd be cool if you can command any bugs to swarm or something. You can definitely say that your swarm... It's just uh, whatever's around you. Yeah. Like, you can walk into a forest and all of a sudden you have a bunch of, like, like little, like, uh, like... Fireflies? Sure. Oh, well, let's say you walk into a, a swamp <laughs> and you have a bunch of fireflies around you. Or you walk into a forest and you have a bunch of, like, beetles. And then you walk into a desert and then you have, like, scarabs that are around you. You know, there, there are bugs... Or a swarm of like ladybugs, that'd be pretty cool too. I mean, the flavor is all up to you guys. And I actually have an idea for this, but at seventh level, you can you can fly a bit with your bugs, your swarm. Are they always with you? They're always with you. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. You but, can you can have it, like, if you don't want to like- I was gonna say, better not be flies, otherwise they're gonna think you're stinky. Well, you can have it like your your spirit, your bugs crawl into your, your armor and obviously you don't feel them because they're spirits mm. you can say that they crawl into your armor so that they can't see it oh no this ain't gonna end up well don't oh. spill mom's coffee huh hopefully you can jump buddy come on come on you're come gonna on. go or you're not gonna go go on are you rethinking he's this decision rethinking. come on he's a cat but he's not a very graceful cat he's he's looking at the <laughs> uh so at 11th level you get mighty swarm uh, your swarm grows mightier, and nope. you can do uh, your damage increases from an additional 1d6 to a 1d8. He redacted. <laughs> uh, the, if a creature fails its saving throw against being moved by your gathered swarm, basically if you want to push them 15 feet and mm -hmm. they fail, you can always you can also cause the creature to be knocked prone. Don't need the book. So not only do they get pushed 15 feet, they also got knocked on their ass. <laughs> uh, and when you're moved by your giant swarm, instead of five feet. Uh, it also, oh, you do get five feet, but also gives you half cover. So now you have a wall of creatures blocking your, your, your body. And the last thing you get as a swarm, uh... It can't be dispelled, right? It's just... No. These are creatures that have bonded with you. Hey! <laughs> you get swarming dispersal. Uh, you can, you can discomport. I can't even say that. Well, the cat's butt is in the way. Discorporate. Discorporate into your swarm, avoiding danger. What? That's insane. Uh, when you take damage, you can use your reaction to give yourself resistance to that damage. So if you get hit by... Tommy says, can you fly using your bugs? You can. You can at, ele at uh, 11th level, 7th level. What if you summon like really giant ass bugs? <laughs> like, does it matter what size they are? I don't think it's, it matters. I don't honestly don't think it matters. They have to fit in your space, though. Oh. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could still get like a pretty big bug. Oh yeah. Bugs, and then they push you up. You okay there, man? Like, <laughs> what's that one beetle that's huge and it's got like that giant nose that splits? It's like a uh, like a horned beetle or something. Those things are giant. 
some murder <laughs> you. hornets. You can, you. you can summon some murder hornets. Nah, too early for that joke. <laughs> uh, in addition to... Is that what they were doing in 2020? Yeah, They're right. They're fucking around with Tasha's. In addition to giving yourself resistance to that damage, you can also vanish into your swarm and teleport within 30 feet of you, reappearing within the swarm. So basically you can fall into your swarm, take only half damage, and teleport somewhere else. Which is pretty Excuse cool. Me. A rhino beetle. Yes, thank you. So my idea for the, for the swarm keeper uh, ranger is there is a race of creatures called a Warforge. Warforges are sentient robots that you can play as. They were created, they have a little bit of magical thing going through their veins, they are made of metal and sometimes wood or something along those lines. Uh, Avelina, what's going Hi, on? Hi, Avelina. I like Toby's like, get the biggest bug we have on Earth and ride it. Yeah. Uh, Become a Beetleborg. That'd be really cool. But no, uh, my idea for this one Swarm Keeper creature would be your Warforge, who, I don't know why I keep going to it, but you grew up on an island, uh, or at least you were created on an island, and the swarm of creatures that you've selected are hermit crabs. <laughs> like a uh, like a Warforge. Do they, they have... Wait, do they have to be bugs? It, it suggests you can use bugs, but I wanted to reflavor it. Mm. You don't have to go by the book always. If it says bugs, I'm going to reflavor, reflavor it to a hermit crab. Um, essentially, the idea is that hermit crabs have their squishy in the inside, thick shells on the outside, like a warforge. And so the warforge has bits of shell all over his body. Um, and I'll give him a high AC and uh you know he would have these little tiny hermit crabs crawling all over him he has a little bit of coral reef mm. growing on his shoulder that's cool like that was really cool and the idea is has has anyone ever seen a hermit crab or a crab in general dig into the sand you know just just imagine that but these spiritual hermit crabs can walk on air and if they wanted to dig they almost open like a little a little tear <laughs> and then they s disappear. So that's... Don't do that. <laughs> so the way I flavored it was that, well, these creatures need to help you fly. Because one of the abilities, uh, Riding Tide gives you the ability to fly. And I said, well, how about they are constantly digging, reappearing where you are, like almost digging upwards, and they are lifting you as they are almost digging into the ethereal plane. Just... Ch -ch -ch -ch, and you're just riding onto this swarm of hermit crabs. I feel sorry for them, they have to lift a war forge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what I thought, and the swarming dispersal, which I thought was really cool, was because you get to disappear into your swarm. Well, what if they start to dig all around you and you fall into this ethereal pocket and then they can dig upwards and bring you back 30 feet? That'd be cool. Yeah. So I had, I, I thought of that idea. Unfortunately, there is no good pictures of a war forge with a hermit crab aesthetic. But one day. Challenge accepted, people. Get on. <laughs> get on. <laughs> you ask the internet, there will be art with it. Can talk art of it in a matter of moments. I'm really happy, though, Avelina is here because uh, they were the only ones who requested a subclass oh, for yeah. us to create. And that was the Twilight Cleric. So let me go over some Twilight Cleric abilities. Which I was going to make Vera, but it didn't make sense for her story. I just found it interesting. And then we were both going to make Twilight Clerics, but then I went with a monk and I was like, yeah, no, I want you to make the Twilight Cleric. Twilight Clerics are really cool. Not with my art skills. So Twilight Clerics, let's see, Peace Domains, Twilight Domain, here it is. Uh, so essentially Twilight Clerics thrive when the sun is going down or when it's coming up. That one sliver of the time of day hour. where the twilight hour is there. Um, they get a few spells as a twilight cleric. Fairy fire, sleep, uh, moonbeam, sea invisibility, aura of vitality, Lehman's tiny hut, aura of life, greater invisibility, circle of power, and mislead. Mislead? Mislead. What the hell is that? Mislead's a really cool spell. <laughs> Essentially what you can do is that you, let's, let's use this room as an example. I can sit here 
close my eyes, cast mislead, and a duplicate of me mm. walks out. My real body is sitting here deaf, blind, but I can see through my, my duplicate. Oh, like a familiar. Like a familiar. And you can control your duplicate walking around. It can touch people. It can be touched. But if it gets damaged, it disappears. Uh, it can talk. It can use your abilities. It can do anything. But if someone were to detect magic or dispel the magic, your duplicate disappears. <laughs> it's a really cool ability. Um, it's like duplicate. Excuse me. Duplicate and uh, what's the what's the spell that she uses for duplicate? It's just duplicate. Oh, um, for gesture. Ge oh, that's a. Yeah, I think it's duplicate. I forgot what it's called though. I know. It's a trickery domain. This is a little bit of it. This is a little bit of protectiveness and trickery. Yeah. I was like, it's like a mix of familiar and that that spell. Uh, like the time of day, you know, when it comes to twilight, it's uh, the colors of light start to dim away. You only have dark shadows to, to see things now. Um, the witching hour. Yeah. You know. So at first level, as a twilight uh, domain cleric, you can see you have a dark vision now up to a range of 300 feet. Hmm. They can see everything at night. <laughs> It is amazing. Uh, so the way it works is that within this radius, dim light is bright light to you. Darkness is dim light. So it's pretty good. So you, you send them up front. <laughs> well, no. No? They also have an ability within this eyes of night to give this eyesight to someone else. Oh, that's cool. So if you have a barbarian who can't see in the dark, you can touch them and immediately they have a 300 foot dark vision. And you can use this ability a certain amount of times. It's pretty OP, it's pretty <laughs> good. Um, then you have Vigilant Blessing. Uh, as an action, you can give one creature you touch uh, advantage on the next initiative roll. This ability does uh, ends after you've used it or until you cast it again. There is no time, time frame. Well, so you don't have to take a long rest. Uh, well, you get the b ability when you use it again. It does take a long rest. So the idea is, wait, do you? So I'm asking, like, is it only once per long rest? No, it doesn't say so. So essentially early in the morning, you can touch one creature and you can say, you have advantage on initiative rules. <laughs> and let's say you don't fight until next week. You still have that ability. You still have it on you. Until if you, you remember. Yeah, if you remember. <laughs> Uh, so one thing that tw uh, clerics get at level two is their channel divinity. They can either <laughs> use that channel divinity to turn undead, which every cleric gets. You can spend it on that, or you can spend it on a class specific feature. The twilight cleric gets twilight sanctuary. As an action, uh, a sphere of twilight emits from you. The sphere is centered on you and has a 30 foot radius. Uh, and admits dim light. The sphere moves with you and lasts for a minute. Whenever a creature, including you, ends its turn in the sphere, you get the following benefits. You can choose one. You can get temporary hit points equal to 1d6 plus your cleric level. So immediately when you end your turn there, you get some extra hit points. Or you can end one effect, like charm or frightened. It's pretty good for a minute. Yeah. You can constantly give people that, which is pretty good. At 6th level, you get Steps of Night. Uh, you can use a bonus action and give yourself a flying speed of your walking speed hmm. for just a minute. You're basically stepping on shadows and sunlight. Like, and don't go too far. <laughs> yeah. Fucking drop out of the sky. You can fly, which is really cool. Uh, every cleric at 8th level gets either a potent spell uh, potent spell casting or Divine Strike, which gives you either a bonus to your cantrip dam damage or your melee damage. This gives you melee damage, so they get Divine Strike. It's nothing too interesting to talk about, it's just what every clerics get. Um, at the last level you get for clerics, the 17th level, uh, you can do the following. You can sum, uh, the Twilight that summons you offers protection uh, and your allies. So when you summon your Twilight Sanctuary, uh, you now, every creature within it has half cover. Hmm. So basically every creature has a plus two to their armor class. 
He's like, I am the darkness. <laughs> You're very protective, <laughs> which is really good. So I did make I did make a character using this. Uh, there we go. There. Meet Nan. And it's uh, N A. A N. Uh, N A W N. Oh, okay. Nan. So let me see if I can like find it. Like bread or not? <laughs> I think so. Is that how you spell it? No. It's not with a W. That's what I was asking. Uh, the full name is Non Evertide. And this person is a tiefling. So a blue tiefling. Is that how you spell it? It's N I spelled no, it No, I thought Non is N-A-A-N. The whole point of it is Evertide is a phrase used for when you're hitting that twilight hour and non is a joke or at least a variation on dawn. Uh, that's so, clever. So non ever ever tied. And that also fits with Claire uh, with uh, tieflings because tieflings are very much on the nose when it comes to their names. What's that on his hand? Is that a shield or a wig? That is a shield uh, with what looks like to be like almost like if it was like a collection of clouds. That's cool. Um, yeah, it just looks like it's had work done to it yeah. versus being flat. It's like all etched and stuff. So keep in mind, this is a cleric, but I made a little difference for him. <laughs> so making friends didn't come easy to none. While some who didn't know him personally would say it was because of his tiefling heritage. But to those who did know him would say it was his constant need to embellish the truth. You couldn't help it. Uh, the ones who fell for most of his lies were those who stayed up late until the morning, tired and drunk, or those who just woke up and weren't fully conscious. Uh, and besides, if he was caught lying, he simply had to run into the dim shadows of twilight and he would show up the next morning with a new batch of lies. It's not a wig, Fatal. <laughs> it's a... It's a... It's a shield, an embroidered shield. And Theo's pissed that he's a liar. <laughs> uh, the local thieves guild found that his sharp tongue was very useful. And so was his healing embrace given to him by Saloon, the goddess of the moon. How could he pass up this opportunity and join? Nan now accompanies his party as they travel the lands, pulling off bake heists, doing cons, uh, all while Nan plays as the simple healer that needed help. Plays as the, the distraction. The con artist. Mm -hmm. uh, though they started off as a simple party, as simple party members, Nan started to grow attached to his party and swears on the moon maiden herself that he will protect his friends and show them, uh, will show them the, uh, will shower them in the healing light of the shadows or the healing uh what did i write here <laughs> will shower them in the shadows of twilight if harm were to ever come to them i like him i do too i made him a very charismatic clerk hey we never said clerks had to be good <laughs> which is yeah a good point when you're creating your characters guys is that you're i enjoy character creating characters who are good yeah because if you're only out for yourself and or you're evil it becomes very one-sided it D, D is a group game and if you're only about yourself you're not playing well with others and it's boring unless you're all assholes then you know well maybe <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> and then if you're all assholes who have to work together yikes then that's a maybe because if you're all assholes who have individual goals then why play with others? You know? I think it's all in how you play it. I guess so. I'll be right back. You're stuck with the kid. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Nan. I have one last character that I created for you guys. Okay. Well, I'll go over this. I'll go over the class yeah, abilities. Class. <laughs> I'll go over the class abilities. Uh, which is really, really cool because I love... I've created the Unearth Arcana version of this character. I love Nan. Yeah, he sounds cool as hell. Uh, there is a subclass for the Warlock called the Genie. In the past, it was called the Noble Genie because genies, by their nature in D&D, are very fucking evil. 
yes, I understand that you guys have seen Aladdin and that genie, you know, the Robin Williams genie is super charismatic and happy and very hopeful and wants to help his buddy. D&D genies are not like that. They are fucking assholes. Uh, they will enslave everyone they can because they think of them as royal. They think of themselves as royalty. Because when it comes to elemental planes, which most genie are associated with, because there is the jinn, which is the air genie, which is actually what genie from Aladdin is. Uh, there is the Tao, which are earth genies. They're made of rock and stone and gems. Um, there is the Fridi, which is the fire genies. And then I actually forgot what the water genies are, but they're almost like fish creatures. So all of them are kind of assholes. They all rule a section of the elemental plane. Don't believe Disney. Yeah, I mean, the only reason a genie in D&D will give you a wish is if they wanted to, if you can trick them enough where they, you know, you go, well, you're so powerful, I bet you can give us a, you know, a wish and it wouldn't even be a big issue for you. And it would go, yeah, I'm a big fucking deal. So yeah, genies are pretty toxic. But you can actually, as a warlock, sign a, a contract with a genie and they'll give you some abilities. So this is what it is for a, a warlock. You have made a pact with one of the rarest kinds of genie, a noble genie. Noble genies are a little bit higher than your standard genies. They're a little more good still assholes but they they have they're a little a little better uh yeah so they delight in turning the tables on mortals who often bind genies to their servitude so instead of when you sign that pact with a genie instead of you having them in a bottle they kind of have you in a bottle and that's sort of the point of a, a genie warlock so when you begin yeah, <laughs> when you begin, more like signing a contract with the devil. Exactly, that's exactly how it is. And you can actually do that as a warlock. You can do a fiend pa uh, pact. You can sign a contract with the devil and you get fire abilities. But for genies, you can choose the genie you wanna sign that contract with. You can choose a Dao, oh, it's right here. A, a Dao, a Jin, a Freedy, or a Merid. That's the water one. And depending on your choice, you get s different spells. <laughs> So at first level, you get Genie's Vessel. Your patron gifts you a magical vessel that grants you a uh, grants you a measure of Genie power. Wanna put the cat in the Discord chat? Uh, the vessel is a tiny object that you can use as your spell casting focus. So you can actually hold up a small lamp and that can be your focus. Instead of a wand, you have a lamp. Uh, and it's up to you, you can decide what the object is which is pretty cool. Uh, within that genie vessel, you can use a thing called Bottle res uh, Respite. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I am horrible. <laughs> uh, bottle Respite, which as an action, you can banish into that vessel. So if you chose a lamp, a ring with a compartment, uh, a like an actual like wine bottle or like a lantern or something you can actually enter in that thing a wine bottle <laughs> which is pretty cool and the idea is that you can essentially the the stronger you get as a warlock the more time you can spend in that bottle you can rest in that bottle you can take 10 minutes in there and you can take an hour long rest so you can essentially spend more time in the bottle and time will slow down from the outside which is really good for a warlock because <laughs> unlike, unlike other spell casters where you have to take a long rest eight hours to get your spells back warlocks only need an hour no they just need a short rest right you just need a short rest so what you can do as a genie warlock is you can spend 10 minutes even shorter and get your spells back which is really fucking amazing. And if you ever lose this little thing, you know, your little, your focus, your, 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 your genie vessel, you can, all right, fine. They took my, my lamp. You can spend 10 uh, an hour, sorry. You can spend one hour and get it back. 
Bottle of spite or respite? Respite. Respite. Sorry, respite. <laughs> um, in addition, depending on the genie you chose, you get uh, you can deal extra damage equal to... Oh. oh. I deserve Somebody. that. buddy. <laughs> you can deal extra damage depending on a different, a, you know, like a damage type. So if you chose an Ifriti, which is a fire genie, you can do fire damage extra. At sixth level, you get a thing called Elemental Gift. Once again, depending on the genie you chose, you now have resistance to that damage type. So if you chose uh, a, let's see, actually I'll have it here. If you chose a Merid, which is a water genie, you now have resistance to cold damage. In addition, you also have a bon you can use a bonus action and give yourself a flying speed of 30 feet up to 10 minutes. That's pretty good. It's pretty damn good. At 10th level, you get Sanctuary Vessel. When you enter in your genie's vessel, uh, you can now choose up to five willing creatures to accompany you. Go hide out in this wine bottle. Yeah, <laughs> and you can take, all of you can take a long rest that as long as you can stay in that, that vessel for 10 minutes. <laughs> so the idea is that if you, if, and at this point, at a 10th level warlock, you can spend like 10 hours in this vessel. Something there's a, there's a chart here that tells you how long. But you know how some wizards, they go, well, I'm gonna create a, the Linum's tiny hut, the mm -hmm. dome, or I'm gonna create a, a, a sanctuary for us to stay in. Excuse me. You know, a magical- uh, uh, Magical mansion or something? The magical like mansion, which is yeah. a spell. As a warlock, or this genie warlock, you can go, guys, do you want to hang out in my, my lamp? <laughs> you place the lamp somewhere safe, hide it, and you enter in, everyone. And you can just sort of stay in there and rest. Yeah. You always, you're always carrying a little bit of a, you know, a home. <laughs> so does someone need to watch the bottle? Like what happens if someone takes it? So that's an interesting question. I actually looked this up. You can actually, someone can move you. That's it. And you won't know it. So if everyone enters the bottle and someone finds, you know, a wine bottle where your guys are all staying in. Will they try and drink you? Nothing will happen. Oh, okay. <laughs> but they will, they will be, they'll have it and they won't, I think the idea is that they won't be able to open it. Oh. Can they break it? No, it's magical. Oh. Um, when it comes to magical items, you can't really break them or damage them. Unless they're OP yeah. as fuck. Like when it comes to, like, all magical items in D&D can't be can't be broken. You need some sort of magical ability to break it. Does time pass slower or faster in the bottle? Time passes faster inside the bottle. So while it's an hour <laughs> outside, it's only 10 minutes inside. So who's on bottle two? Oh, no, the opposite, opposite. <laughs> uh, it's only 10 minutes outside, which is an hour inside. Somebody that's hardy, Temple. Maybe they can carry the bottle in their bag while but everybody of, else rests. Think of it this way. Imagine you have a, a member in your party that uh, is a noble. And only they got in, uh, uh, invited to a special party. But you want to bring your friends. But they can't get in. All right, everybody in the lamp. Everyone in the lamp. <laughs> have the noble guy carry them in their pocket. Walk through the door. Oh, hey, guys. Hey, guys. Go into the bathroom. Pop them out. So if time's faster, can you see a time lapse in real time? That is a good question. Let's see. Everybody's fascinated by this bottle. It's a really cool ability. Uh, so here it goes. As an action, you can magically vanish and enter your vessel, which remains in your space. The interior of the vessel is an extra dimensional space in the shape uh, of a 20 foot uh, circular radius and 20 foot high and resembles your vessel. The interior is appointed with cushions and low tables that is comfortable and has comfortable temperature. Oh, while inside, you can hear the area around your vessel, uh, but it does not seem that you can see outside. Hmm. So you can hear everything. Hear somebody talking shit. So if someone was carrying your, your vessel <laughs> or your little lamp, you can go, all right guys, come out, you know, all right, come outside. And they would come outside. Which is a really fun ability. Well, if you can hear, then you could probably hear somebody's trying to pick your ass up. Yeah, no, you probably would. So there's a little bit of a like a an alarm, but if you're asleep and unconscious as a DM, I'd say you probably wouldn't hear it, depending on your passive perception. Not if you're Caduceus, where he has like twenty something fucking <laughs> perception, he hears all. So the last ability that a genie warlock gets 
is Limited Wish. Limited Wish is fucking amazing. Uh, you enthrall your patron to grant you a small wish. As an action, you can speak the desire to your genie's vessel, requesting the effect of one spell that is sixth level or lower. The spell can be from any class. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You want to cast Mass Cure Wounds? Talk to your patron, they'll do it for you. If you want to cast uh, Trans... So is six level or lower? What do we, is Transport via Plant a six level spell? I, I think mean, it is. I think so. But if, Mass Cure Wounds, I think, is a fifth. That you could do that. Six level or lower. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, I think, Regenerate or Resurrection or some, one of those small limited resurrection spells someone's dead you can cast resurrection through your through your through your lamp that resurrection is like an ace i don't remember but i think there is a lower resurrection spell that if you you have to roll a dice to see what body it turns into something like that a generator i think yeah uh if you want to cast transfer via plants if you want to go across the nation uh <laughs> through one tree and come out of another tree because that's a spell that you can cast as a druid you can do that. It's pretty crazy. I think I, our DM hates that. Once you've done this, <laughs> once you've done, once you've used this limited wish, you have to roll a d4, and whatever number it lands on, you can't use this feature again for that many days. I just seen Toby's other question. If you hear something, is it like fast chipmunks? <laughs> you can flavor it that way. Wait, are you a fast chipmunk, or you hear somebody else talking like? Because you said it's faster in there. So do they all sound like fast well, chipmunks? No, it, I think it'd be slower in there. I got the... I got the, the oh, okay. The, the, so the idea is that time slows down while you're inside here, meaning you can spend longer in the, in the, in the lamp than it is outside. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so essentially, if you spend a, a full day in there, it's, it's, uh, it's only been a few hours outside, which is pretty cool. But Limited Wish is amazing. And especially when, as a genie, when you, let's see, when you get to ninth level, you can cast, or when you have the ability to cast ninth level spells, you can cast Wish. Wish breaks a lot. Wish of is fucking broken, but it's a genie warlock, which is amazing. <laughs> and I did create a character using this. Let's see here. There we are. Charles. <laughs> can you wish for another limited wish? If you want to break things. Let's see here. I feel like your DM would make you roll for it. Well, the thing is, as Wish, you do you can keep on using Wish every day. <laughs> what a stash. You can, you can just take a long rest and get it back. I like him with his Reno 911 mustache. I do too. So <laughs> this is Charles Quincy. He's a level 5 genie warlock. And here's a little bit of his backstory. He's human. Oh uh, yeah, I can gauge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Charles lived most of his life as a con man within a small town adjacent to a large, expansive, and mostly uncharted desert. Hold on, Theo. I just see Theo go, hold up. Hold up, I, he's saying, hold up. He looks like an asshole, but nice. He's a con man. Oh, it's every day. Nice. <laughs> Is it? I don't know. I just, I honestly went to Pinterest and I took some pictures. <laughs> So, so here we go. Uh, Pinterest is a rabbit hole. So, it is a, he lives next to a large, expansive, and mostly uncharted desert. Those who wish to scour the land for buried treasure and his hidden secrets are easy to fool. A small fake treasure map here. Um, to like an already excavated tomb, a small tip about a fake landmark, that doesn't exist. All easy. Takes a little bit off the top. Boom. He's gone ahead and make some money for some fools who are looking for some gold. Uh, he even, uh, at times, accompanies uh, his targets uh, on excavations. He brings them to an uncharted tomb or temple that he's already excavated and he's looked over a million times. And he brings him to this new space. Uh, unfortunately, it's already been cleared out, this pyramid. 
and he and he tells his, his targets, oh man, I guess a group of bandits has already beaten us here. Let's look around, see if we can find anything. And if we can't, oh well. But you found this temple that I only heard words of, you know, only only rumors. They head back. He's already been paid, but unfortunately his targets didn't get what they were coming for. What an ass. He's kind of a he's kind of a neutral, chaotic character. I made him. But the way it happened is that one day, after accompanying a random group of adventurers to a pyramid that he's already excavated, they trigger a trap that was that Charles was unaware of. Uh, the entrance closed and locked them in. Uh, the room started to fill with sand and fire. Hidden blades started to appear within the sand, causing a bit of a doom. Um, as the party screamed for help, everyone was silenced as the tomb claimed its newest victims, all except for Charles. He discovered, well, with the discovery of the trap, a room has op had opened up that he was unaware of and walked it in, safe from the tomb's traps. Within this small room, he dis discovered on a pedestal, a small golden smoking pipe. Uh, as he picked up the pipe, a voice called out, asking him, draw on my power and save yourself. In exchange, all I ask is for you to become strong enough to wish me out of this prison. Agreeing to these terms, he was teleported back to town. He now travels the world filled by a promise, and maybe, because of his newfound powers, more opportunity for gain and gold. So the way I had it was- a Sneak is not friends with Sneak. <laughs> so yeah, that's what I loved about it, is that, you know, genies aren't good guys. You know, they're generally not. I mean, a noble genie may be good, you can definitely flavor it that way, but the way I made it was that this genie wants out, he has a bit of his essence tied to this smoking pipe, which is his vessel. Uh, and now he's sort of accompanied by a con man who kind of likes having these powers. And uh, he has no problem of letting this guy out. So I, I liked I liked this character concept, especially because I really wanted a genie character. <laughs> I like genies. You actually get, you guys, our, our magic at Mosted party ran into a genie. Yeah, we didn't know that's what she was, though. Yeah, I think if so, we can't break the fourth wall. If Temple's, if Temple's still in the chat, um, newsflash: you guys ran into a Dao, which is an Earth genie. Yeah, she was real charming. Yeah, <laughs> she wanted out. Generally, genies don't like to be hooked up in the dungeon. The one that we undid the cuffs for. Genies are evil. They don't like to be subjugated. They don't like to be enslaved. Yeah, well, somebody was smart enough to enslave her ass down there. Think about that. You can hear a cat <laughs> starting to cry, guys. Fake cat is back. <laughs> Stevie's yelling at me how he didn't how didn't know. Oh, how he didn't know. She was spooky. Well, yeah. I wasn't sure what she was, to be honest. I knew she was somebody like really powerful, but I didn't want to go genie on it. That's why she had the ability to control and bring up walls of stone. Genies can do a lot of shit. Hey, leave those presents alone. And that was laughing because I was like, I wonder if these guys are going to try to fight the genie because genies can kick your ass. Here comes, we're, sw we're swapping cats. Cat number two. <laughs> so I think, let's see what time it is right now. Okay, it's like 3.30 right now. Uh, let's go over one more subclass, and then I think what we'll do is we'll go over an, uh, a new feature that Tosh has introduced, and then we can go, we'll see where it goes from there. So what do you guys think? What kind of, what kind of class are you looking for? An artificer or artificer? depending on how you want to call it. Uh, I have a barbarian idea. I've talked about it. You've talked about a lot of stuff. <laughs> Do you guys want to learn about a new bard? Uh, maybe a new cleric beyond the uh, the twilight. 
thief uh, thief with thief subclass. There already is a thief subclass for rogues. They are very quick with their hands. I'll say that much. And uh, they're good at stealth. Yes, buddy. They all like the book. <laughs> the kids like the book. Mm -hmm. Luke. Okay, 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 okay. I'm looking for earth or ice. Earth or ice. Let me think here. Earth or ice. Look at him. I know, he's... <laughs> Hmm. I don't know if Tasha's has anything that is very much, oh. Maybe you can flavor it this way. Cat number two is gone. Leave that present alone. We just talked about this. Hey. Yeah, let me see if I can find something. Let me go back to Warlock. He really wants to destroy a ribbon. Yeah, here, let me go back to Warlock. <laughs> Luke. Hey, leave that alone. He's looking at me here like, we go. what did I do? <laughs> uh, there is a patron for the Warlock called the Fathomless. Uh, the Fathomless. Oh, is he still messing with it? Yeah. The Fathomless, uh, essentially what you do is that you make a pact with a underwater creature from the water elemental plane of well the elemental plane of water um or like essentially you make a, a deal with a kraken that's not Luke. that's that face <laughs> or you can you know you made a deal with uh, a merit you know or you made a deal with oh no merit is a genie that would go underneath the genie subclass um i don't know it's up to you you can flavor it any way you want Find yourself a giant, scary... Maybe you made a deal with a, a dragon turtle. If you don't know what a dragon turtle are... They're terrifying. Fucking amazing. They're essentially moving islands with a giant turtle underneath. It's pretty cool. So, you can definitely no. play... <laughs> oh my god, what's up with this kid? <laughs> He's like, let me eat her cord. Yeah? Uh... So you can, <laughs> the abilities that you get here, you can definitely flavor them in a certain way, in a certain way. Actually, I think what a really cool ability is that you can make a pact <laughs> with a sea hag. And this is where you get these abilities. So Steve says, can you make a deal with Cthulhu? Uh, yeah, isn't that a great old one? You would know. Rally says it has a great old one packed with Cthulhu. <laughs> you could definitely flavor it that maybe, you know, it's it's more of a... Huh, oh yeah. Yeah, an ancient one. I mean, you could flavor it in any way you want. But this is what the abilities you get as a fathomless uh, warlock. At first level, you get Tentacles of the Deep. You can magically uh, summon a spectral tentacle that strikes at your foes. As a bonus action, you can create a 10 foot long tentacle at a point that you can see within 60 feet of you and the tentacle lasts for a minute. Uh, when you create this tentacle, it can make a melee attack against a creature within 10 feet of it. And it does a certain amount of damage and you can, act, you can as a bonus action, you can move the tentacle up to 30 feet. Uh, as for a ice uh, centered ability, you can definitely say it's like an like almost like an icy like uh, glacier that starts to grow and move on its own so instead of an actual like a squishy tentacle it is a rock an ice rock hard creature that moves how many tentacles are we talking about here we can say <laughs> you can flavor it as one giant one or you can say a swarm of smaller ones that create this sort of moving mass of 10 feet which is pretty, it's actually kind of creepy if you think about it. Uh, you also get some expanded spells lists from your Fathomless Deity or your Patron. You get uh, Crater Destroy Water, Thunder Wave, Gust of Wind, Silence, Thunderbolt, Sleet Storm, uh, Control Water, sell, Summon Elemental, but you can only do so for water, uh, Big Bead's Hand, which appears as a group of tentacles. I was going to say, that would be a cool flavor. Mm -hmm. Or Cone of Cold. So you get all these really cool things. Uh, also, at first level, you get the Gift of the Sea, 
which grants you a swimming speed of 40 feet and you can breathe underwater. So yeah, you, you feel very comfortable underwater. Uh, at sixth level, you get Oceanic Soul. Uh, you are even more at home at the depths. You gain resistance to cold damage. In, a, in addition, when you are fully submerged underwater, any, any creature that is also fully submerged can hear you. So you can actually speak underwater. Which is pretty cool. Fucking okay, much call it. <laughs> and when they try to talk to you underwater, even though they are losing air and they can't really fully get it out, you can fully understand them. Uh, at sixth level, Guardian Coil, your tentacles of the deep can now defend you and, in, uh, and interpose itself between you and any harmful attack. So as an action, the tentacle can block a damage and reduce the damage by 1d6 or 1d8. And it starts to get better as you hit level 10. This book likes to add appendages or creatures. <laughs> it all depends. As long as you're within the creature's 10 foot radius. You know, if you summon the, the tentacle, this icy glacier moving symbiote type uh, ability or this tentacle, and you're within 10 feet of it and someone tries to strike you with a sword, it'll do its best to block and take some of that damage for you. It's pretty good. At 10th level, you get Grasping Tentacles. Uh, you learn the spell Avard's Black Tentacle, which is a, a spell where you create an area of just blackness of inky goo that can like grab you and start to sink you down. Which is really cool. <laughs> yeah. um, but whenever you cast this spell, your patron's magic bolsters you, granting you a number of temporary hit points. So not only can you cast the spell, but immediately you 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 know get some HP. I mean, it sounds like a pretty good deal, except for what the hell does your patron want? That's up to you and the DM. <laughs> That's flavor wise. I only need your soul. Oh, okay. <laughs> you are signing a contract whenever you are a warlock. You are, huh. you are essentially granting your soul, your services, your body, your magic, your family, whatever. Your firstborn. Yeah. <laughs> Make it flavor. This is all up to you. Uh, then there's the Fathomless punge, Plunge, which you get at 14th level. Uh, as an action, you can teleport yourself and five willing creatures that you can see within 30 feet of you. Uh, so you can teleport and you vanish reappearing one mile away from uh, in from any body of water that you've seen. This is pretty good. Like faced up, kind of. Yeah, you can face up, face step uh, to any body of water <laughs> that you know of. So let's say your home is from the shore and you're stuck on an island. How are you going to get home? You got you are days apart. Bye, guys. <laughs> you are weeks apart because of you have to ship travel. Your ship is gone. Take five people. Travel via the sea, and now you can reappear anywhere within a mile of the shore that you know. That's fucking broken. It's pretty like good. I, said, I feel like Tasha has a lot of broken shit. Like it's great if you're a player, but it's pretty good. I mean, it's it's good. Um, once you use this feature, you can't use it again until you take a short or a long rest. What's essential is an hour. You take an hour to take, you know, take a <laughs> breath, and you can do it again. And in in the idea of an ice-centered, uh, fathomless warlock, maybe what happens that is you start to each party member that you you and you start to trans, uh, trans, uh, transport turn into a block of ice, into a glacier, and you sink deep into the the fathomless, and you start to rocket. That'd be cool. Yeah. I so yeah, there's a lot of cool things here. Um one thing that Tasha's introduces is uh group uh abilities. So like it'll give you like what happens if you join a guild? Well here are some benefits that you can get for joining a guild. Maybe you have more information about the land. Maybe if you all worship like your party all worships one god maybe you start to share options and abilities and religious checks so that dude okay it, uh... yeah <laughs> oh yeah and then there's some new some new uh, spells that tasha introduces that's what i was trying to look for that's like mm -hmm. great yeah. what well okay. <laughs> you can 
Uh, you can do a mind whip, meaning you cause sat psychic damage. It's something hey. that they introduce. Another cat messing with another present. Leave it alone. Here's really cool. Let me see this one. Okay. Da, 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 da. You have Tasha's, Tasha's Caustic Brew. You spew out a line of acid, which is a really cool ability. So there you have this uh, spell called Tasha's Otherworldly Guys. Uh, you're immune to fire and poison damage. Basically what you do is you draw on the magic of the lower and upper planes and give it to yourself. So you're either, either immune to fire and poison or radiant and necrotic. You're either uh, immune to the poison condition or, um, or the charm condition. You get special wings on your back. You have a plus two your AC. You just keep on, you're, you're adding, this all happens to you, which is amazing. Um, there was another one that was really cool. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, the biggest thing that Tasha introduces when it comes to spells is you can, they give you options to summon a bunch of creatures. You can summon a, a, a celestial spirit a construct, a construct spirit, an elemental spirit, a fiendish spirit, a shadow spirit. You look right at the camera. You can do a lot of, <laughs> lot of stuff. I don't know how this cat knows. Let's see. I, the another thing that they introduce in Tasha is that you can, you can customize your spell. So a good example that they used was there is the spell magic missile oh, yeah. which is a common spell you shoot out these little arcane bolts little darts well if you wanted to personalize it do it maybe your bolts are not little tiny bolts In this example is a farmer sorcerer who hurls magic missiles that that look like chickens mm. look at all of them chickens yeah so you, can, <laughs> you can just basically summon a bunch of chickens uh, the Real Big Man, thank you so much for following. Very much appreciate it. Welcome to Books and Brew, where we are drinking a little bit of whatever. Whatever. Whatever, and uh, we're I also talking my, about books. I think my whatever is almost done. Yeah, mine is too. I'll cover one more thing here in Tasha's before we end the stream. Um, maybe we, we can cover a little bit of the Heroes Feast, because that's fun. Uh, magical items. Yeah, I was going to say, do we get new stuff? You do. Uh, there are a bunch of things. <laughs> if you have money. <laughs> One of the bi biggest things that they made official is magical tattoos. Oh, yeah. That would be cool. Are that, they as expensive as they are? That, like how Critical Role made them? It's up to the DM mm. to set the price. Um, but there are really cool abilities. Um, basically, what they have is they, they you only have a limited amount of space where you can put tattoos. Um, you can put one on your hand or your foot or a quarter of a limb. There are uncommon tattoo abilities that take up a whole limb <laughs> or your scalp. Got a whole sleeve. <laughs> um, or no, sorry, half a limb. There is rare tattoo abilities that give you a whole limb you have to take. Uh, very rare, which take up both limbs and your chest. And lastly, legendary, which takes up two limbs and your entire torso. That's going to be a pretty penny. Yeah. We need your help on Newegg. Uh, talk to one of the mods, man. <laughs> right now, I am doing a stream. Thea. Yeah. <laughs> help. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure there's a mod, uh, big man. Talk to a mod. So there's different abilities that you can get. Uh, you can get damage resistance. So you will constantly have a damage resistance on you. So, your resistance to acid, cold, fire, force, lightning, necrotic, poison, psychic, radiance, or thunder. Well, you can only have one at a time, or can you have like multiple? No, I mean, again, it's all about how much body you have to give. Okay. So, um, depending on the rarity of the ability. <laughs> that tattoo must be good at its entire body. I don't want an ugly tattoo. <laughs> Hope it's an awesome design. <laughs> Yeah, and well, I mean, you can obviously talk to your 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 tattoo artist in game and say, I want uh, a tattoo that has the different cycles of a moon down my arm, you know? 
uh, you know, a crescent, a given, a half, and then of course the opposite, and as we start to get to full moon. And you can definitely have that. And you can say that it takes up your entire arm, meaning that it is a rare tattoo. And that would be here, where the effects are, is that, let's see here, I believe you get certain spells through your tattoo. You can do the induce or enlarge spell, feather fall, or flesh to stone. Oh, and to more others, gaseous form, magical weapon, or polymorph. So you can, you have three charges on your tattoo to use this and you get them back after you take a long rest. That's pretty like fucking OP. I feel like that's gonna be expensive. And then you have to find somebody that can give you the tattoo. Hmm. Cause I don't think it just appears, right? Well, no. I mean, again, the tattoo, you have to find a, 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 a an arcane tattooist. <laughs> tattooist? Tattoo artist that can do it. So, it's pretty, I mean, again, you're essentially getting a magical item that's always on you. <laughs> so it's probably gonna be expensive. Thank you, Theo. <laughs> I imagine it's a negative mark, like, uh, you get this power, but it's a bad tattoo. That could be, that could be it too, maybe. Maybe somebody tattooed you and you didn't want to be tattooed. What if, it, what if it's like this, is that, um, you can always flavor it this way, is that the tattoo artist that has this ability to imbue you with this arcane ability is part of an evil guild. You know one member and you help them out and they'll give you, you know, one tattoo. Payment, of course. But unfortunately, you don't get to choose the design. Maybe this tattoo artist only knows how to give this ability by using, essentially, is like the mark of a devil or a demon, you know? And... It's like a tramp stamp that you don't want to talk about? Essentially, yeah. Uh, or yeah, maybe you there is a, a, a guild it's like, that handles in, in slavery and they that have sucks. to mark you with a mark of slavery. It doesn't mean you're a slave, but you have now that mark. You know, it's, it is very much flavor wise that you can do this. Um, so yeah, magical tattoos are very cool. Um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about all of the uh, the magical items because some of these I want to introduce into my own campaign. Obviously, you can look them up if you wanted to, but you never know what I'm gonna sh what I'm gonna choose. But yeah, and then Amber got me this for Christmas, which is Heroes Feast. Which we'll probably be trying to make something out of. <gasps> we should do that today. Oh yeah. Me and my big mouth. <laughs> well, probably not today. Let's try this tomorrow. Yeah. Let's go to the grocery store. We'll pick up a few things. And then we'll try to do this. It's called Instacart. Please send us a plate, please. <laughs> there are some really good, like, look at this. This is hand pies. Essentially, like, hands, you know, pocket pies or something like that. Let me see this. I'm trying to make it sure that the, glow, the glare doesn't. <laughs> Cooking stream? I've been thinking about it. We did that once, or what, Mike tried to film me, but then I was like, I don't like that, that footage. Candied apples. Hey, mm -hmm. stop hitting me with your tail. Candied apples. The way they've broken up this book is that they've broken up into like five sections. Human cuisine, dwarven cuisine. Okay, I don't need meat, but that looks good. Oh yeah, what is that called? It is called the, hold on, I'll read it. The Sembian honey glazed roth ribs. Woo! Ew, that ribs. is ketchup. Nope. What? No, it doesn't. It says a fourth cup of cat, bro. Ugh. Oh. <laughs> we don't need ketchup in this household. I told you I need the po the Pokemon donuts. <laughs> Soy I've been idea. Wanting, I've, been... I've been wanting to eat those in real life since I've seen them. <laughs> oh, but Pokemon. anime food. That's really good. There, I've watched uh, when some... I was, when I was a kid, I loved ketchup. As an adult, it just tastes like sugar paste, and now I like mustard. Has so. anyone seen Ghibli food, like Ghibli films? Oh, the way he draws food, or the way their their team draws food. Mmm. Gingerbread mm. man. Oh, those look good. Oh yeah. They kind of look like they're in trouble though. Yeah, I'm gonna put this here. I got raisins for mouse. <laughs> they look like they're in pain. Oh no! Help! <laughs> 
I'm gonna try to make sure that there's no glare. There we go, that's pretty good. <laughs> I'll put pictures in the Discord later. Yeah. Pokemon Donuts Temple, Pokemon Donuts. <laughs> Miner's Pie. That Ooh. looks good. Bangers and Smash. I know, I know. You like Irish food. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. <laughs> Normally, if your D and D character it's normally bangers and mash. If your D and D character ever goes up smash. to a tavern and says, "I want some bangers and smash," your DM's gonna go. You want hookers? Do you want hookers or, or are you, you want food? What are you looking for? Once you're done reading that, I'm gonna show the picture because or oh, show okay. the picture because oh, look at that! Look at that! Right. Oh, there you go. There we go. Mm. <laughs> I'm hungry. What's yeah. in it? What's in it? What's in it? Um, Yukon potatoes, leeks. Okay. Chicken. Mm-hmm. Cherry tomatoes and parsley. Oh, we can make that. You can definitely make that. Under dark lotus with fire lichen spread. Mm -hmm. There's not a picture though on that one. What that means? Lichen lichen. Miner's pie looks good. I'm not a fan of shepherd's pie, even when I did eat meat. I'm just hungry, man. Can I... we order something? <laughs> you need a yeah. side trust. If you're not going to cook, I want food. So <laughs> halfling. halfling cuisine. Now they have halfling cuisine. Yeah, they have human, elven, dwarven, halfling. What the fuck is that community cheeses? It looks good and gross at the same time. Oh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, melted cheese. Yeah, it's like kind of like in a fondue pot. Yeah, you can make yourself. But it a doesn't fondue. look like good cheese. It looks like shit cheese. <laughs> Stuffed egg battered toast. Chicken something dumpling. Come on, guys. Come on. This is this is torture. They kind of look like something dumpling. Oh, look at that. That's good. <laughs> they don't look like they look like bread mixed with chicken. Like they don't look quite hogs and bed rolls. I'm assuming that's pigs Cut in a blanket. Out. Yeah, and all of them have like this like D and D related. Everything. Yeah, soup? like name. Hey, do they got elf food in here? I'm kind of curious. They do. What they they do have elven food. You may want to go to the first page and you can see like the uh, index. Ooh, fire spiced abyssal chicken kebabs. <gasps> kebabs, dudes. Kebabs are great, man. <laughs> Theo Yo, with the I, fat cat. Yeah. I can go for some kebabs right now. And then at the end of the, at the back of the book. Twice baked, I don't know what the hell those are. This is the tabaxi or long-tailed feline human is known for their innately inquisitive. I don't know, I guess this is a tabaxi oh, recipe. What the hell is that? Uh, cockatrice, sorry, cockatrice. Cockatrice are these like um, flamingo type creatures in D&D &D that can petrify you. Oh, well, you know what? I'm glad they're dead. So they made chicken, a chicken dish out of it. Deep gnome trillimac pods. Oh! I don't know what the fuck that is, but... Oh, I want it. I don't care. Look at the pictures, guys. Picture looks great. <laughs> are you laughing because I've said it, I'm glad they're dead? <laughs> I wonder if they have like a beignet dish, because beignets are great. Ooh, I don't know what that is. Barbarian butterscotch pudding. Now we're just hungry. Welcome to the end of the stream where we have <laughs> drank our drink and we are hungry as hell. Fried fingers. That doesn't say anything. Fried fingies. I know it says humanoid parts. Great. Oh, great. You're going to cook up some fingers. I'm good. Oh, now you're going to do some elixirs and ales, aka some drinks. That one was pretty, but I don't want that. Oh, mule wine. That's an old fashioned. That looks like an old fashioned. <laughs> the best part. Yeah, talk about finger food. I'm attached to my fingers, thank you. The mind flare? Hold on, let me see that. It's a. Uh, it says vodka stored at sub-zero temperatures, combined with pressed ginger grape juice for a hazy purple hue, mm -hmm. and finely crushed ice. So it's, it's served, a vodka drink, okay. Served so cold that if your first frosty gulp doesn't zap you with a mind-numbing brain, bre brain freeze, then the alcohol blast that hits right after just may. 
I was like, who's touching Yo. my who's touching my butt? It's the there's, there's, there's no picture to it, but it does it's show just a mind shows blur. A mind blur. I like these. We gotta try these. Maybe. We'll, oh, we'll, maybe that is it. Hold on. Thanks. I don't know what you're doing. Back what then. we'll do, guys, is that if we can't pull off a. I a, think this is the mind flare one. If we can't pull off a, 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 a purple a, one, a cooking stream, we'll definitely have a drinking stream, and we'll we'll start to put together some of these things. This also requires me to go to the store. I have food, but not like all this. This looks cool. But definitely, I want to do a cooking stream with this thing. The Cholton or Chol probably pronounced that wrong. Zombie. I like the little demon guy with the ice in his mouth. By the way, if Temple, you're still in the stream. Uh, there is a funhouse video uh, that Sorry, that deal cat. that deals with the concept of a the peanut butter robot concept, which is a programming terminology where if you were gonna tell someone how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you'd go get some bread, get some jelly, uh, you know, some peanut butter, put it onto the bread, and you can eat it there. Unfortunately, when that's it comes just to, a thing of bacon. When it comes to programming. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Computers don't know that you have to unscrew the top, get your knife, get a little bit of peanut butter, put it onto the thing. You have to get them step by step. So I'm thinking it'd be fun for you guys to see if you can direct me and make a peanut butter sandwich, peanut butter and jelly. I'd like to stream that. Hopefully one day we can. I have a GoPro. I'll definitely use it. So again, we're still continuing our normal group session, guys. The campaign oh. is not over. It's just that half our party deserved a well-needed vacation, yeah. so we're doing this to hopefully provide you some content you like, and maybe we'll do it in the future. Yeah, this looks like that's a up to the that's up to the the instructors. If they tell me to put peanut butter on my face, I'll do it. Oh, is that a salad? Yeah, it's oh. a that's a wood elf for a salad. Binks, you're gonna make me fall on my ass. <laughs> Are you looking at the elven cuisine? Yeah. Look at that Dra mushroom. Drow mushroom steaks. Uh, Look at that drow. I have an elf in real life. Woo! <laughs> Look at that mushroom steak. It's black. <laughs> I like the... I'm going to get real close to the camera. The... the no, you got to remember where the camera is. The potion that's like right there. And that a demon looking thingy. We just got back, guys. We miss you all. Aw. I'm happy that you guys had your break. Uh, Temple and Steve, very much a Savannah. I hope it was a, an actual break. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I think we're going to call it there. Because I'm hungry. Yeah, now, <laughs> now we're getting hungry. And I don't know if I'll be able to last much longer. So thank you guys for joining us today for Books and Brew. And our characters, our newly created characters. Yeah, some, some concept character ideas that maybe you guys would like to use in the future. Or maybe that is a, a good springboard to maybe a new character you want to use you know, in, in a future campaign. Uh, definitely it was fun for me because it got my creative juices flowing and I was able to create some interesting characters that maybe I want to adapt or use a change for my own, you know, uh, uh, campaign. Yeah, I like Phoenix. We'll see. We'll see, you know, and uh, it's one of those things where even if you, we can't use them now, you have them in the bank. <laughs> you can use them in the future. Use so, them later. Uh, we'll be back uh, next week at 2 o'clock, maybe. Uh, I know sometimes uh, Temple does have her own work to do. And I, think, to go I think it should be 2. We rotate between 2 or 2.30 just to accommodate some player schedules so yeah. they're not, you know, driven into madness. <laughs> and that's the last but, thing we want. Yeah. So, it should be 2 next Saturday. Um, yeah, and we'll continue with Magic at Mosted. Uh, the last we left off was that our players, characters, uh, released a earthen creature, which now I've re revealed as a as a, a, as a genie. Dao, as a genie. They've collected uh, a strange gem, and oh, yeah. and now they are now heading we back. gotta get the fuck out of there. And before the end of the uh, end of the session, they started to hear footsteps and chains coming from the same hallway that they were coming out of. So they're somebody's me seen us. So and they have met two uh, hooded. Uh, ho ho uh, hooded humanoids dragging along another person who has been bound in chain. <laughs> so, we'll see what happens in the story at Mag Magic and Mosted next week. Later, guys. Bye.